Hi, welcome back to Design for Health. I'm Dr. Kyra Bobinet, a co-instructor with Dr. Larry Chu, um, who is the executive director of Stanford Medicine X here at Stanford School of Medicine. He's also an assistant professor in anesthesia. And we are really happy to have everybody here for the final class of this quarter. Yay! Um, we're really privileged to have a wonderful e-patient moderator today, Emily Bradley. Uh, Emily Bradley is an e-patient blogger who writes about her experiences with chronic pain, rare disease, and autoimmune arthritis at chroniccurve.com. Emily was selected as an e-patient scholar as, at Medicine X 2013 and an e-patient delegate for Medicine X 2014. She studies biology and psychology at Florida State University. Please welcome Emily Bradley after this message. If you are joining us for the first time, a quick reminder that there is a simultaneous conversation happening on Twitter right now using the hashtag MedX. Christopher Snyder is the in-class moderator for today's program and will be taking questions from social media. So please make sure to start up your Twitter client to join in the online conversation and interact with today's speakers. Christopher Snyder, otherwise known as I am Spartacus is moderating the online tweet chat discussion this evening. We also wish to remind you that registration for Medicine X 2014 is now open. Don't miss the year's premier patient centered conference on emerging technology and medicine. Unique opportunities such as our masterclass program and our IDEO design challenge workshop have extremely limited space availability. You'll want to take advantage of these programs while our regular registration pricing is still available until August 1st, 2014. Please also make sure to like our YouTube page at www.youtube.com forward slash Stanford Medicine X. Please note you are watching a live online program and there's a delay between real time events and the live stream you are watching. Tweets from our in-class guests will appear before you see the real-time events they are tweeting about unfold on the video live stream. Sixty years ago, this would have been a devastating diagnosis. Those were the first words I heard upon being handed a diagnosis of inflammatory arthritis. I was 18, naive and I walked out of that doctor's office thinking I would take a few white pills and go back to the life I had always known. I went back to school at the beautiful Florida State University and I didn't realize it then, but my life had changed. But this was not the beginning of my story and in fact I struggled when writing the speech. I struggle with this now. And I struggle in every exam room with every physician that I will ever see. Where do I begin? The patient story. It is complex, and for most, it is not linear. It is only years later that patterns emerge and pieces come back together to form a timeline that makes any sense to both patient and provider. Hindsight is 2020, and this rings true for my own story as well. To describe to you the extent of my journey would require five Ignite talks alone. But I can tell you that five years later, I have many different diagnoses, all with different treatments, and different outcomes. At the age of 10, my journey into the healthcare system began, although some say it started much earlier, <laughs> when I was diagnosed with a severe case of scoliosis. I had extensive corrective surgery, and I was fine, until I wasn't. At 17, I noticed terrible pain in my lower back. I saw doctor after doctor, 
had all of the diagnostic tests possible, but any defect was impossible to see due to the metal artifact that was placed in my spine years earlier. Well, I do not fault physicians for not being able to see what was wrong. I do fault them for not taking my pain seriously. It was during this year of diagnostic testing that I found myself in what I now know as my first flare. My hands curled into stiff claws and I, my hair fell out in clumps. Every fiber of my being burned. My muscles burned. I stood in my dorm room in front of a mirror under fluorescent lights and watched as the skin on my arms turned a salmon color pink. Something was wrong. It's just stress, they said, but it wasn't just stress. The surgeons treating me whispered the words hypochondriac and attention seeking behind closed and pulled curtains. I soon began to doubt my own sanity. Were these symptoms real? Was this pain real? All of these clinicians heard my words but did not listen to a single thing I was saying and they did not listen to everything that my body was screaming. Eventually, I sought out physicians. Eventually, I sought out specialists highly regarded in patient communities and stopped taking referrals from the physicians that had invalidated me. I fought for my diagnosis of Still's disease and my disease was relentless and stubborn, and I did not respond well to initial treatments. I was placed inside a clinical mold in which I did not fit. The symptoms that didn't fit the diagnosis code were subtly and not so subtly swept under the rug. Treatment was carried out in a strict protocol, a series of steps made for a black and white disease. But nothing about my story, my symptoms, or my disease activity was black and white. I traded my athletic shoes for a handicap placard, and I traded my independence for the back bedroom in my childhood home. And when I began to grieve for my life, what it had been, what it was, and what I thought it would be, my tears were noted as symptoms, and I was handed only more white pills. There was no discussion of the life that I was grieving, the pain going untreated, and the medications not effectively suppressing my immune system. Not only was I not heard, but I was never given the opportunity to use my voice. While my disease might be rare, my story is not. We have a healthcare system that drowns out the patient voice. They walk these halls, in this room, in this hospital, silenced, isolated, confused, and feeling alone. So much so that even the most seasoned E patients often have trouble breaking down that wall. I stand before you today, considered engaged and empowered, and yet I am without a physician that works with me as a partner to fight my own rare diseases. If you are going to call us stakeholders, you must first let us take a seat at the table. Let us come to your medical and nursing schools, not just to learn, but to teach. Rely not on books and blogs alone to harness the power of the patient narrative. Interact, connect, and collaborate with us. Talk to us and with us, not just about us. And whether you are a de designing a hospital or a treatment protocol for your eighth patient of the day, let us help draw the blueprints and do not lose us in the numbers. Behind every statistic and every dot on a scatter plot is a person with a journey and a story just like mine. The mark that invalidation leaves on one patient will last for them forever. If there's one thing that you take away from this today, it is to look outside of the box. Listen. Do not let a deeply flawed system take away what connects us on a fundamental level. I ask patients in my communities this question. Though their responses were unique, their voice echoed one same theme. Listen to us, validate us, and most importantly, look outside of the box. Though I speak on behalf of myself today, I also speak for them. Thank you. So on that note, I would like to introduce Nick Dawson and Dennis Boyle. Nick is the president-elect for the Society of Participatory Medicine, 
holds a Master's of Hospital Administration from the University of Minnesota, and has more than 15 years experience in work in hospitals in a strategy and operational role. Today, he's focused on helping health systems develop a modern strategic focus based on human-centered design. Dennis Boyle is a partner and founding member of IDEO. Based in Palo Alto, he leads the health and wellness practice. He holds a BS in mechanical engineering with an emphasis on industrial design from the University of Notre Dame and a master's in product design from Stanford University. So when we come back from this short clip, we will uh, talk to Nick and Dennis. Thank you. Time to take another shout out to Twitter. If you are following this conversation online or on Twitter, Christopher Schneider, otherwise known as I am Spartacus, is moderating the Twitter discussion on the MedX hashtag. If you are just joining us, we have with us today Nick Dawson and Dennis Boyle, who are wrapping up this quarter's Design for Health class at the Stanford University School of Medicine. They are speaking on the topic of putting it all together and looking at how we can apply design thinking principles to healthcare innovation. E patients and caregivers out there, what questions do you have for our speakers today? What emerging trends do you see in the fields of behavior change, healthcare design, and human centered care? Healthcare providers, technologists, and researchers out there, how might you use the design thinking process to inform your own work in industry, medicine, or academia? Tweet us your questions or responses, and we'll do our best to have them addressed during this class in the Stanford University School of Medicine course, Design for Health, for Thursday, June 5th, 2014. That's a marvelous way to start, a great uh, inspiration. And so let's keep going. Uh, Nick and I uh, brainstormed about how to kind of bring this to a close, and we, we thought that trying to get outside of things that we've been thinking about would be a good way to, to, to kind of start the next phase, which is you out in the world as design thinkers. So I'm going to set up a, a, a project that we're going to do here uh, for about 20 minutes after this talk. And uh, it's based on the work that we're doing at, in, uh, at IDEO.org, which is a spin-off of IDEO. It's a nonprofit spin-off that does work in the uh, developing world helping to alleviate poverty with people on the ground, in, in engaging people that need what, what design to help, help themselves. So um, a little bit, you should be getting used to these kind of diagrams now, what design thinking is, this overlap of uh, people factors, business factors, technical factors, innovation somehow is a balancing act, but starting with design thinking, starting with the, what's desirable, what's uh, what, what people need is, is key. Uh, listening to uh, patients. Uh, so trying to understand what people need at uh, lots of different levels and uh, using this design process. And so we're going to do a little bit of that today. So uh, who is IDEO.org? Well, two women designers at IDEO had this, had a brainstorm. They saw us trying to work with foundations and, and uh, Jocelyn and Patrice and it wasn't very successful, so they said, "We're gonna, we're gonna set up a, a nonprofit, and then uh, all these organizations that can't work for for profits might might be able to use our process." And so, well, it's worked. Uh, it's up to almost 30 people now out of the San Francisco office. It's uh, they're a lively bunch. Uh, they have six to eight uh, fellows each year that come from outside of. Uh, the organization, and maybe one of you could be one of these one year. So uh, there's over 35 projects in all sorts of different areas, water, sanitation, health, lots of health, and energy, youth, and so on. Now I'm going to hit a few, uh, but Gates, uh, Rockefeller, uh, Acumen, Bezos, Ted, uh, Wasserman, and so on, all these foundations have uh, found a place to um, have design, think encourage design thinking and support design thinking. So. These kinds of projects, as we've learned, start with how might we, what if, what's the future of. Uh, and so today I've got a few stories from the field, from far afield. So this will hopefully set up a little interior project. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that, that after some stories here. Um, 
Unilever Foundation and this Water Solutions for the Urban Poor was up um, as a kind of a clever little, uh, but how might we develop new opportunities for urban sanitation in Kumasi, uh, Ghana? This is a Western um, African country, small, uh, but um, quite populous and with almost no sanitation in their major cities. That's millions of people are camping next to each other permanently. Um, and so they, they, they asked uh, the IDEO.org team to go and try to figure out how to make a difference here. And so naturally as a bunch of designers and engineers, we kind of start with like, how can we make something that will fix this? And so looking at kind of camping like toilets to, to uh, see if we can start there. And what came out of that was this very simple, kind of a lot of clever, low cost design that uh, separated solids and liquids and had a very easily um, empty tank and cleanable. And the idea was that we would get people to um, take them, uh, their tanks and empty them in a, in a certain spot, but nobody wanted to be seen taking these tanks from here to there. So that was a failure. The, the, the product itself worked, but the, the system, there was no system. And so what came after that was an experiment. Well, let's look at what little businesses work. Maybe we can pattern ourselves after movers or uh, garbage collection agencies. And what came out of that was a, a very clever little business that, that trained people, had branded people uh, uniforms, had a system to collect waste and turn it into uh, energy and, and fertilizer. And it was a little virtuous cycle. And that created a business that now uh, over 25 people work at. And there's a thousand families in Kumasi in a pilot test. And they're building um, a 10,000 family pilot right now. So this looks like it's start off on a good start. So this is a good example of something that looks like it's going the right direction using this design thinking process. So World Health Partners is another NGO. That they, how might we improve healthcare in the rural Bihar region of India? In, the Bihar region is a, a north, uh, west, northeast uh, part of India near Nepal. It's a very rural part of India, uh, but it has 110 million people that live in this very rural state. So it's a it's still populous, but the vast majority of people live in small, very small villages or medium-sized villages. Uh, and frankly, there are very few doctors in this region, although there are many health professionals. And these are somewhat trained people. Some people call them EMTs or somewhat more trained, somewhat less trained. They've, had, they've, they've been inherited their business from their parents. They've learned. Uh, on the job, uh, there's a, a lot of different training, but it's all over the map. But they're very well respected and they try very hard. So uh, they, they are actually affectionately known as quacks, which is hard to believe. There's a, something lost in translation, but th th that's a term of respect in, in, in India, in this region. And they're very dedicated and they try hard and they have little practices just like doctors here. They just don't have that much knowledge or experience in, in some cases. So the idea is how to supplement them, augment them, help them, help their businesses. And so there was a great deal of effort by teams from IDEO.org who joined with teams on the ground there from some of these organizations that supported this work. And to understand what the practices were, what the needs were, and how, how the, these people might be helped. Uh, and, and um, there's a lot, of, a lot of problems, a lot of needs. But what, what's um, being experimented with is telemedicine in many different forms because there's quite a bit of internet uh, capability here. And so um, uh, computers, uh, connections with the uh, physicians in the city centers like uh, Delhi, um, and, and uh, posters and, uh, and training manuals to help for when things get beyond their uh, their, their experience, you, you, can, you can call in the, 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 the uh, call in some experts here. So this is, a, this is an ongoing experiment being supported now, uh, supporting uh, cleaner, better exam rooms, uh, um, helping with uh, um, record keeping and uh, bookkeeping that uh, is a need. And then uh, help, help with taking samples, bodily fluid samples, and moving them from 
where they're taken to little labs that are, are, are being set up all over um, this region and help with the distribution of, of, of medicines. Every medicine is over the counter in this region of uh, India. It, they're all being sold in, in food stores, and so you can buy pretty much anything. Uh, and so that, that's, they're trying to gradually modify that and uh, move to a system of uh, distribution of medicine so it, it's safer and better and makes it a business. So the sky meds on, on scooters and motorcycles is being experimented with. And then they're supporting uh, um, small drug stores as businesses to uh, be more professional. And uh, so this looks, this is still in early stages, but it, the success has um, had other regions and parts of Africa looking at this as well. So this may, this may scale at some point, but so far it's in the early stages. Another cool project is planting teff in Ethiopia. Who knows what teff is? Anybody? Oh, well, there's one. Teff is the smallest um, grain in the world. It's practically like dust. It's, it's, it almost pours like water. So it's, you can't deal with it in a normal way that seeds are dealt with. And it's been, for thousands of years, they've just broadcast it in, in their areas uh, where they're growing. And then it competes with itself. So you have to use a lot of seed and, and it, it, it um, competes with itself. So they've discovered that if you can plant it in rows, you, um, uh, you can use 10% of the seed and you get twice the um, output. So it's remarkable, but they don't really know how to do that in rows. Um, and so there's been a big effort to, to experiment with some sort of a planters that they can pull along and, and do this. And so uh, uh, the teams have been on the ground and again, getting people on the ground to start to own this problem and go beyond the, the traditional way of just throwing the seed out there. And how do you distribute uh, the um, uh, fertilizer as well is the same kind of problem. So what came out of, what's come out of this is a, is a couple of prototypes that the teams have taken over there to experiment with and to find out what the problems are, how, how simple can this be made so that the likelihood of people on the ground can take this over as small businesses. That's the goal. Um, and uh, so far, somewhat promising, but they found some pretty challenging problems. And this is one of the biggest ones, which is in the rainy season, everything turns into a bog and everything just sinks down and, and it, you're, 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 um, you're, you're, you're dead in the water here. So, what came out of this is uh, one of the fellows who owned a little machine shop who was making some parts there came up with this very clever idea uh, to, to take a, make a wide uh, wheel and put burlap on it. And for some reason, the mud kind of rolls off the burlap. This is what the whole thing's going with. So we're making 50 of these planters right now, and they're going to be delivered in the next two months over in time for the planting season. And so this... Well, who knows? This is another early phase, but again, this is design thinking and using the people on the ground to take, start taking on this problem and then hopefully owning these businesses eventually. And then the last thing, the Global Alliance for Clean Cook Stoves, how might we increase the demand for and use of cleaner cook stoves in Tanzania? And so this is a horrific problem, a giant challenge. O over four million women a year in the world die from lung cancer and respiratory disease directly because they're in inhaling smoke from these fires, mostly wood. And not only that, of course, then they're stripping the forests of the world because they need, to, they need fuel, they need to cook. And so we, we, this is another effort of going there and trying to enlist the, the help of people on the ground and trying to understand what the culture uh, needs and what, what, what their practices are and what, what the opportunities are for changing the paradigm in some way. Fuel is a, n nearly equal to rent and food and cost. So what, 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 what uh, these very low cost kind of wood stoves are, are they're like, almost like throwaway. They're, they, no one aspires to own them, uh, but they do aspire to own these neat uh, lamps that are powered by solar or music systems or even televisions now. Stoves are kind of way off in the back and nobody cares about them. So the, the, the team has been on the ground trying to figure out how to move people out of wood up to at least charcoal, more so than that, kerosene and alcohols and gas. And, and 
in, in a way that people can afford, moving up this fuel ladder, if you will. And so the concepts are, that are coming out are marketing them in some ways, cook for less, and uh, creating um, better uh, kinds of uh, stoves that uh, can, can be convertible for different kinds of fuels, and uh, making stoves that are, by design, are more attractive and people aspire to have them like some of the other things they aspire to have. And then last, this is, a, this is the most successful thing, is this whole campaign of cook in your best dress. People can't relate to that I'll die in 20 years if I don't do this. They relate to they can cook and entertain in their dress. And this is a very attractive thing. So you have to figure out what, what people need on the, at that, on the spot. So this is a cool thing. So I'm going to move to this uh, little video at the end here. Turn that up. that's uh, obvious. Learn from quick and scrappy prototypes. Look at, each, look at other local industries for inspiration and start these projects in a specific region. And then last is try to figure out what's going to be a business. Don't just go help people and, and leave. Basically, give them something to do. Give them a business. Help them be entrepreneurs. That's the, that's the key thing I'm seeing. So. That's it. So, um, cool. I think that's a setup for for yeah. Nick here, my partner in crime. So, well, great. This is fun. So we are um, we are literally making this up uh, tonight. This is going to be an experiment, and we might break some stuff, but we're going to try to do uh, a MedEx first, right? This will be a interactive brainstorm here in the room. We're going to move really quick, and we're going to involve our Twitter and online audience at the same time. We're going to try to keep them really engaged so that they can see what you're up to and that you can see what they're up to. So without further ado, let's get rolling here. So the, the question we're going to pose tonight is uh, how might we teach patient-centered design in countries with fewer or less resources uh, than we have? 
And so what we want to think about is, what are the cultures of, of those countries like? What do they have that we don't have? Uh, what are their needs? What are the folks they're thinking and feeling? So really kind of get into the heart of this, and maybe we can pull some of those things that Dennis was just thinking about as well. What makes a good business there? Uh, to do that, we're going to ask you to divide up into groups, so we're going to go ahead and do that right this second. So uh, let's actually huddle together. So maybe this third of the room right here, I'll be back on camera in a minute. This third of the room, you guys will represent, uh, let's say, India. And this third right around in here, you guys will be Ghana. And this third will be Tanzania. And if, if somebody in your group knows a developing country better than one of these three, pick that one instead. You're, you're open to choose. Twitter, folks, online audience, you're going to be Kenya. So you take about three minutes, use your phones or your tablets if you have them. You guys need to get moving here. You all need to huddle together and make this work. I didn't see a lot of action. Twitter folks, you can actually stay seated at your desk because we won't know what you're doing or not. But you're huddled virtually, right? So uh, they're, they're on Kenya. Too. They're on Kenya, right? So the Twitter team is the Kenya team. And we're going to take about three minutes with your groups. This ought to be out loud. We ought to hear a lot of boisterous action here. Uh, do some quick research, maybe Wikipedia, see what you can learn about the country. We're going to move into 12 minutes of brainstorming. So we ought to hear you really out loud. Go for wild ideas, build off each other's ideas, be very verbal and vocal about it. Feel free to move up to a table if you will. Yeah, let's move rearrange this room. I mean, really, let's get going here. And then uh, the last three minutes, or two minutes maybe, we want you to pick uh, the best idea that you want to share and maybe the wildest idea that you want to share with the group. Twitter audience, we're going to keep you engaged. We're going to throw your ideas up on the screen so that everybody can see what you're doing. So let's get rolling. Take about three minutes and... Um... Yeah, we know this isn't much time, but we're just trying to get outside all the things we've been thinking about and go, go wide here. Yeah. So. All right, you're on. You're on. So Twitter group, start thinking about Kenya, and I'm going to join you on the tweet chat. If I want to play Would you music, like a, plug in a, here, a do we table, think? guys? Yeah, we can play it from Pandora. Well, I was going to play... So I do this. Yeah. They, how, how, what have you learned that you? How could you teach what you've learned? What, what are what are some ideas that will help you uh, spread this? What you've been learning in in a, another culture, uh, especially the developing world. That's that's the idea here. I think you guys were India. So yeah. so what how how what can um what are they? What's, what, what are ideas that will help you spread this, what, this, this, this approach, this process? So like the, um, like the patient education or the, the yeah. peer support and the I think so. online yeah. groups. Especially getting, get, how do you get, get, people you get, get, get to understand what the problems are? Maybe okay. that's a one way to start. You know? okay. And you know, it's not a bunch of smart people thinking in a room of what the problem is and solving it and then go right. show it to the people. No, okay. that doesn't work. Okay. <laughs> We've tried that. It doesn't right. work. <laughs> right. So, yeah. all right, I think so you got I, it. So, so start. All right. Wow, that was, that was a great job. Very good. Make sure you guys are on the right spot. But you know, the, the, the place isn't as important as just ideas in, in a developing world. The Ghana thing might be kind of a nice place to focus because we learn that if you, if for everybody, it's not as easy. But but um, it's what what one or two things can you think of that? That you've kind of learned through this this experience of this course that that may need to have a different way of propagating or or uh, what, how 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 do you think you would um, you know have a te teach um, th this kind of process and and get, get make sure patients are at the at the center of innovation or people that need people that. Need, the people that need what you're, the, the, the innovation are, are, are well represented somehow. It's probably the remoteness issue, right? The fact that they're probably remote and rural, that, that you were just talking about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and or probably not as educated uh, about medicines and devices. Um, cultural issues about that. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so, all right, maybe that, uh, maybe though you can pay, piggyback off them or, um, 
or people do gather for holidays or for uh, for celebrations. So maybe there's a there, so you I, I you just, pick. I just, I just found that uh, Ghana has Africa's highest mobile broadband usage rate. Oh God! So well, okay, cool. Then, then you got you got it. Then, yeah, but but what happens in Africa a lot is people tend to have more than one cell phone. I've seen that a lot. And they're time. starting to do commerce on their Pesa, phones. Yeah, yeah. It's, but that's Kenya. And Pesa is Kenya. But I know they We'll just transfer it over some. They also do something. They, they ring and they so hang up. Yeah, yeah. Search phase and, and jump into the brainstorming and get the ideas going. So, 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 so maybe there's a way to uh, distribute the cell phones. But... And, and, and to track medical or, 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 or you know, like it's a flash mob. A you can get people to come together to say, "Look, we've got a bunch of uh, pe people that need help here. They're AIDS patients, or they're, you know, they're, they're they're cancer, and we we as a as a community have to help them somehow. And there's a flash mob through phones that get to come together somehow. Yeah. So you know, to be like an SMS, uh, yeah, almost like a Twitter for help, uh, focused on yeah. Then, 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 just start writing that up, or start write that down and, and develop it. And I think you're you've got a, a nice little angle there. Okay, good. Um, okay, so is every, are you are you uh, is this going okay here? Yeah, well, I think we're, we're we, we've kind of come to so. We were talking, uh, there seems to be a healthcare worker shortage. Yeah. Um, and so a, uh, we're trying to find out what might be good places for interventions to maybe get an educational system going. Yeah, yeah. Uh, without just sort of trying to blanket the whole thing. Right. What, what specific diseases or situations might be the right place? Okay. Like for male circumcision, that's an opportunity because it's culturally. There's a, there are rituals around it, a great opportunity for the whole family, so the whole family might be involved in it. Okay, good. All right. Well, just, uh, you're on your way then. All right. But I just focus and pick something and figure out, yeah, what, what the challenge is sort of getting people together. What do you piggyback off of or what, so, so that you can uh, decide as a, as a group what to work on or what to solve. Um, uh, maybe that's the choice or the, yeah, yeah. So. Getting the, yeah, getting the power of a group and then using the process to kind of understand what the people really need. Maybe they just, they need transportation, they need, they need better nutrition or something, you know, but, but yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> it's pretty neat, isn't it? Now, can they see it? Can yeah. they all see it? Yeah. So we're, this is what's being broadcast live back from the video feed, too. And can everyone who's putting up there, can they see uh -huh. what they're putting up? Okay. Yeah. No, I guess that's pretty good. But at least, and at least they're seeing some movement, so it's not just watching a class of. Can you? So it's 6.39, yeah, what, 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 do we, what, what do we say? Well, we had till 6.45, okay, so we'll let them keep brainstorming. What I'm going to do is try to go walk around and have them pick a spokesperson up. Okay. Two. All right. And, and then I asked if this group could present from their board. I'll give that option. Otherwise, people are coming up here and talking. Right? I like that. Right. And we have that. We have a mic, too. So. Yeah, I think I think it's like that's the idea is 
a feudal system and a huge gap between what the poor and the poor. So how best people want to show as much as possible that they can afford things that matters a lot. So for example, here, just remember that rent and charge is going to be no big deal. Nobody's going to be able to No worries, you could, but, but just pick two, two, one or two spokespeople and talk, tell, tell about what, you're, what you think might be a good idea. And if you have one, an idea that's, that's kind of crazy, you might volunteer that too. But you don't have to. Okay, okay. So, okay, so. Right. So I guess we should stop thinking. Does that make sense? Yeah, so it's a lot about like who has what and how they contribute. We're going to have you present to the Twitter sphere sure. here and uh, just to say what, what your thought thinking has been so far, okay? One, one idea, and if you have a, a backup that is kind of maybe unusual or off the wall or crazy, say that too, all right? Okay? Whoops. So they might yeah, so like setting up some competitions for an apartment. An idea or you know, obviously it's a partially formed idea, but so what's the what's the problem you're trying to solve? And what is it? And if you what direction have you started going? And then if you have uh, something that's that's what you think is good. If there's something that you think is kind of off the wall or crazy or that is unusual that came up. So who's your spokesperson? Well, you can figure it out. We're gonna. You'll be on the Twitter sphere here too. So, so um, uh, this this looks good. So I've I've just got them all primed. So three or three minutes to go. So then I'll represent this group. Yeah. Get them to start voting ideas. Okay. Yeah. Good. Good. So um, you you will go fourth then. You'll go forth. Do you have a Do you have the mic? I don't. Okay. So we're going to start moving in about two minutes. Okay, Emily's going to take the mic for Q and A, or do you have, like? No, we're going to actually have. Each, the next thing is we're going to actually ask them to present something. Um, and so I've told them to each to pick a spokesperson, and I'm going to let this group part, and they'll she'll probably say something. And he'll zoom in on it, okay, and then so I'll the, move to this group, and then that group. Each everyone gets to talk about their best, what are they their stay direction. In their current um, position, or are they going to move to? The uh, X? I've, I've told them to move to the X. Okay. This so they know one, that? I, I did. I've told that to them. I'll have to remind them. Okay. Um, so uh, do you want me to? Yeah, you want to take this? Yeah. yeah. Why don't you take the mic over there? Okay. And that way, Dennis can direct them over to you, and you can get the mic. But the okay. first one, I think I'm, I'm, I'm. I might just have them stick with this, yeah. so this is a background. They told me they could zoom in on it. Okay. All right. And. Uh, okay. so, I think you still should run the mic. Um, so. You um, I'll let these people. I think it's. Fine. <laughs> I'm going to prime them now. Oh, I love it. 
I think the well, first of all, we're going to present all three, and then Nick's going to present all the stuff that's coming out in the Twitter sphere. What, what, just one idea. Okay. But we may not. I think this is still valuable. Okay. All right. We gotta. We gotta. We gotta wrap here. And so, how about you? Yes. You're the spokesperson, all right? That's right. Yes, we all spoke. No. So here's what here's what we'd like to do. They'll just zoom the camera in here. You guys stay here, and you you just take the microphone, and you just tell tell us what the concept direction you've gone in. Okay. Do you want to? Um, we're gonna. We're ready. So they'll zoom. He'll zoom in the camera. Look, you got, okay, come on over and you want to. Uh, this is a spokesperson, so just give her a little air and let, make sure the camera can see her, all right? Okay, everybody's ready? Nick? They're going to they're gonna go. All right, everyone listen. <laughs> and you're going to present on that X there, okay? All right, ready? We're going to hear from our first spokesperson. Hi, so our population is India, and we picked health. Uh, we talked about some of the common health problems that are going on in India right now. Smoking, diabetes, cardiac problems, obesity, all are preventable and manageable. So we looked at what are the, what are the matrix, what are the challenges, and what's specific to that population. So the priorities of people who are facing these problems, we considered access to health care, we considered trust, we considered money, and we considered the culture of the country and the population. So we looked at, in terms of access, uh, we looked at local access to health care. So that could be through the health healthcare village, village workers who, who are called quacks or they could be called uh, vedyas which is ayurveda practitioners and then now with access to internet a lot of places have telemedicine and access to providers through telemedicine for education and for expert consults so uh, we think that we can use this model for uh, improving access to healthcare um, our speaker before talked about the importance of listening. So we've been looking at what are the things we can consider to help people prevent these health problems and for the ones who have these challenges, how can we motivate them to maintain their health and have better results. So the most important point that came up was listening. So listening to this population, whether it's a housewives and now what are their specific challenges to lose weight or with not eating that sweet when they go meet their friends. So how we can listen to their problems through some social network um, and being able to share with one another because most places have uh, cell phones and internet access, setting up some kind of a gaming model for them so now they have competition with each other and they can help each other using media and celebrity to talk about it, raise awareness and make it a cool new thing and use crowdsourcing to share the information. Great. Wonderful. We've got to move on. I, uh, you guys, you're almost a business already. We're going to launch a business. All right, who's the spokesperson here? You get to stand on the blue X up there. All right. Keep it brief. we got a, we got a wrap here, but that's good. OK. Um, we got together and talked about uh, healthcare uh, in in Ghana. What we did find was that Ghana has the highest uh, mobile broadband usage rates in Africa. So we decided to focus on a mobile solution. Uh, our idea was to basically create a messaging platform where uh, people would. Uh, uh, come and self-report, I guess, symptoms that they're facing, as well as solutions, so enabling a lot of the people that are the quacks, as uh, Dennis was, was saying, to be able to provide localized and uh, 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 real-time uh, uh, location-sensitive kind of solutions or treatments. Uh, and we also thought about an idea of enabling women uh, who are uh, 
uh, caregivers and caretakers or families to be able to use this platform and quickly disseminate messages about uh, uh, you know what they're seeing within the context of their own family or within their uh, neighborhood. Uh, so they become the, the gatekeepers, but also the curators of this ecosystem. But one aspect of this messaging platform that we thought was that the community would be able to upvote uh, at the treatments that are being uh, suggested. So depending on how effective it is, uh, people can actually see uh, treatments that are actually working kind of float to the top. So ideally, we think this will be a scalable solution, hopefully works in Ghana and every place else, but basically takes patient experiences in real time and puts it on a, on a technology platform. So that was our idea. Company starting to get ready to launch here. All right, who's the spokesperson on our number three team? Tanzania team. All right, so we found out in Tanzania that there is a severe healthcare worker shortage, much like many other countries. Um, and a lot of the diseases and issues that they're facing are also preventable, so HIV, malaria, um, a lot of victims of violence. And we started talking about um, it's very difficult to be able to train and provide more healthcare workers. So, how do we start to empower communities and um, individuals to focus on health rather than waiting until they're um, so sick that they actually have? to go to a healthcare pro provider for their um uh, their remedy. So we talked a lot about who's taking advantage of these health systems, what communities are supporting patients. So in healthcare, it's not only the patient who's responsible for their health and their well-being, but it's also their supporting community around them. So we talked a lot about how mothers are seen as very um, wise and respected figures in the community. So developing some sort of community um, education and support network that helps educate folks, but also helps provide them with the tools and the thinking and the support to really be empowered to take their health into their own um, hands. God, give, we give you a couple hours, you could change the world here. Great. All right, Nick, you're on. Right, I'll be really quick. I am, I'm going to represent um, Team Twitter here. And Obviously, this wasn't a competition, but Team Twitter has decided that they were the most prolific, and um, <laughs> as represented by our uh, by our live brainstorming board up here, right? Our virtual post-it notes. So there's a couple core themes that came out of this. The people um, on the Team Twitter did some really awesome research. We found out that um, uh, a lot of things happen in Kenya. Uh, a lot of needs are filled by private groups, or church groups, or school groups, or community groups. That a lot of care already gets delivered by nurses and Again, some of this idea of what they might in India call quacks, some of the lay people who are medically inclined. So the, uh, the, the ideas that we really started to pull together and synthesize from the Twitter group were to use the community resources to teach this idea and kind of reproduce this and really provide travel. So that team either needs to be able to travel or we need to be able to pull in uh, the folks who need that education from rural areas who may not have access to travel. We might need to go out and pick them up. There were a couple wild ideas that got floated around that we thought were worth considering. There was a use of drones that got discussed. Uh, the use of satellites to beam maybe this class back down. Uh, there was a lot of talk about deploying computers and technology. So uh, some really, really wild and innovative things. And how cool is this that we got to do this in real time? This is two experiments in one, right? So we did this in real time with the Twitter group. They got to see what you guys were coming up with. You get to see what they were doing. Really, really fun stuff. This was great. So now do we, we move into our Q&A? Uh, do we have time? We've got seven minutes. Right? Yeah. Seven All minutes. Right. I think Let's we're on, uh, open up on the floor. Time. Does anyone have any questions, comments? Anyone? Yeah? OK. There you go. Thank you for this really fun and amazing experiment. I guess my question is, what next? Like, you know, you come up with diagrams, ideas, you can um, prototype, I mean, uh, build picture diagrams, but then how do you move forward from there and actually execute projects? So if you can talk about that. Design for Health 201 coming up, right? <laughs> On, but actually go to the D school and take a class called Design for the Extreme Affordability, and they do, do things like this. They go on site and design for what's needed. So it's already at Stanford. But there needs to be more. So there are, there are choices. Um, uh, cool. Good, good question. Yeah. Uh, 
So I went to the Health 2.0 meetup last night at the Plug and Play Center, and one of the, just in passing, someone mentioned, it was one of the presenters, they said, you know, I get a text message from my dentist, and all it says is, and this is literally all it says is, you, you have an appointment tomorrow at 6 a.m. It doesn't say who it's from, <laughs> and it can't. And we, so I, I, I'm not an engineer, scientist, or healthcare person. I'm just a little anthropologist guy. So I just asked kind of a dumb question, like, why can't we do this? And the room came alive and shouting and hip of this and hip of that, and, and, and it makes sense. Um, but it seems like um, we have a case where we have some of the abilities to do these things and we can't or don't. And I'm wondering if anyone here who works in, in these kind of fields looks abroad and rather than seeing some, some sort of dire problems, do you guys see anything that they're doing that, that's working really well that, that we can copy? rather than us sort of trying to send stuff to them? Because it seems like, like there are places that are doing like, you know, India was doing SMS banking and things like this, and we would never touch that. And, and maybe there's fair reasons, but I'm just curious if there are healthcare related examples where they're, they're doing something innovative that, that we're kind of it's stuck in. You might speak to, especially in developing countries, but in a lot of places in Europe, uh, patients can work with a pharmacist to self-prescribe certain levels of meds that we can't do here. And it takes a strain off the system. It, it provides a different conduit to easy access to medicine. That's a regulation that's different there than the way we control meds here. And it's kind of an interesting to look at. But what I think that the, the thing that we're seeing where there are just not enough doctors to go around, and there are not in our country, and it's getting the percentage is getting less and less. It's hard, it's, it's hard to become a doctor. Uh, you know, there aren't enough chiras here. So we need to enable a lot more people to be caregivers in better ways, teams and people that, through th this kind of thing we're seeing where you're, you're helping people uh, um, take care of small pieces of everyone's care instead of, you know, there aren't enough doctors and they don't have enough time anyway. So uh, how, how do we do that? So I think there's some inspiration we, we should take from how where they're having a severe doctor shortage, what they're doing, so. Tyra, did you have, you want to comment on that one, I think? Well, I guess, I guess for me, I think um, the first thing you'd have to do is get out of your uh, Western medicine, you know, mindset. You know, they're much better at managing death and grief, you know, and staying together as family and family taking care of family and um, that not being, you know, so broken. And also just even a lot of the, the native or indigenous medicines, um, you know, have fueled the entire pharma industry has preyed upon that and, and figured out how to extract those, that wisdom, you know, plant medicine wisdom and those kinds of things. So I think there's a lot of, you know, empowerment in the way that people approach medicine in areas where they're doing these more natural things, that kind of thing. And because we always measure things according to how many days can we keep you alive after said thing has, you know, happened, then that puts Western medicine ahead in some cases, or at least we think it does. But the quality of life trade-off is enormous, and I think that's something that we lost in all the science. Yeah, I have to say, as a patient, that quality of life loss, um, it's enormous. It's absolutely enormous, and it might be numbers for some of the providers, but for patients, it's, you know, and families, it's, it's lives being affected. Do we have any more questions? Yeah, okay. So tell us the rest of your story, Emily. What made the shift? <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, one minute. Yes. <laughs> so I started blogging anonymously um, shortly after I was diagnosed. And it was initially a way for me to have an outlet. Um, I was coming of age with chronic pain and not coming of age in college like the rest of my peers who were 500 miles away. And what began as me creating a resource that didn't previously exist um, kind of took off. And that was my before and after. Um, I know some people, their diagnoses kind of define the before and the after. But for me, it was really social media. Um, and in my case, it was my blog that changed things for me. And I realized that no one else was fighting for me. So you know, you got to stand up for yourself and be your own best advocate. It was my only choice. Um, I think we don't have any more time for any more questions. I apologize, uh, but thanks for the great question. So, yeah. yeah.
So uh, with that, I just want to thank you, Emily, oh, for such you. a powerful conclusion to this, you know, in your moderation, and also to our consulting course directors, Dennis Boyle from IDEO, Nick Dawson from Society for Participatory Medicine and Online, probably Katie McCurry, who is a wonderful designer and um, experimenter, uh, uh, you know, at the forefront of this, and speaking for myself, Dr. Kyra Bobinet, and Dr. Larry Chu, the course co-directors, we are just super honored and privileged to have had this experience and have learned from all of you and all of the speakers throughout the uh, course, and we just go out on a high note. This was a fantastic way to end. Thank you very, very much. Thank you all. Thanks so much for joining us tonight for this edition of Stanford Medicine X Live. We'll see you back here on June 10th, 2014 at 5.30 p.m. You won't want to miss the next episode of Stanford Medicine X Live. As a reminder, this program is made possible by support from the Stanford University School of Medicine, Department of Anesthesia, Stanford AIM Lab, Stanford Hospital and Clinics, and the Agency for Healthcare Research Quality. If you haven't yet done so, please take a moment to like our YouTube page at www.youtube.com forward slash Stanford Medicine X so you can continue the conversation online and stay informed of program updates. If you have enjoyed this class, please join us again in the fall of 2014 for a new class from the Stanford University School of Medicine on medical education in the new millennium. This course is brought to you by Stanford Medicine X and weekly programs begin September 25th, 2014. Drs. Larry Chu, Nikita Joshi, and Kyle Harrison will serve as co-directors of the course. On behalf of Stanford Medicine X, the Stanford AIM Lab, Class faculty, myself, Dr. Larry Chu, and Dr. Kyra Bobinette, thanks so much for joining us for this course. We hope you have been impacted by the stories we have shared with you and the information that you have learned. Stanford Medicine X believes that healthcare innovation needs to include all healthcare stakeholders, including you, our viewing audience online and on Twitter. Your questions and engagements with us this quarter have added a vibrant voice to our class that is an important component of our success. Please continue to stay informed, educated, engaged, and empowered through the Medicine X community. Thanks so much for being part of our course, Design for Health. We'll see you back here in the fall for our new course on medical education. Also, Please don't forget that registration for Medicine X 2014 is now open. Don't miss the year's premier patient-centered conference on emerging technology and medicine. Unique opportunities such as our masterclass program and our IDEO design challenge workshop have extremely limited space availability. You'll want to take advantage of these programs while our regular registration pricing is still available until August 1st, 2014. For all of you out there taking time to tune in with us tonight, thank you for joining us and being part of the conversation. A special guest to our guest speakers this evening, and 